Well, hello folks. Today we're going to do a little video on the power feed accessory I made and added to my little machine shop 3990 mini lathe that I got almost a year ago. This is a unit here on this end. Uh, and I'll get into a little more detail on that uh, power unit in a moment. But first, just a little background. I essentially copied a design that is very common on YouTube. So I certainly didn't design this or create the concept. Uh, there's a, quite a number of YouTube videos that detail a very similar implementation and I probably watched every one of those. Ultimately, I decided to essentially copy the version from uh, Pragmatic Lee. Uh, he had quite a nice series of videos on creating a power supply, making a power supply, which I also made, and I'll show in a moment as well as the uh, power feed unit in itself. And for all practical purposes, I cloned what he did. Uh, I watched his video probably at least 10 times, stopped it, paused it, took snapshots of it, and essentially tried to duplicate uh, what he did because I thought he had a very crisp, uh, well thought out implementation. I did vary from his design in a couple of places, nothing significant, I'll detail that during the course of this video, uh, but by and large, it's essentially a copy, or at least as close as I thought I could copy, Pragmatic Lee's version. Uh, the one thing that um, I did try to do a little different than, than Pragmatic Lee also, I think, is I wanted to make it a little shorter, uh, so it didn't hang out any further than absolutely necessary. I think Lee's might extend out a little further than, than mine does. So I'll take the covers off here, or rather we'll, I'll get an up-close uh, view of what it is as it sits right now, and then I'll take the covers off and we'll talk about uh, the details a little bit further. Well, there's a unit itself, an up-close view. Uh, one of the obvious things that I did different, I think, from Pragmatic Lee is the cover is all one piece. I think he made his a couple of different sections. I just took a piece of steel, sheet, sheet metal, and bent it all, all out of one piece and attached it with these button head screws that you can see. I, they got what, two, four, five, six, I think there are seven button head screws. I also painted it blue uh, because my mill is predominantly blue. His was red. Uh, by the way, the, the paint that I used, since I couldn't match it exactly, and this is the original end plate, you can see the blue is a little bit different. And I debated what color to paint this, whether to go a black or a machine gray or silver. Ultimately, I decided to go with this blue, which was the closest I thought I could match to the original. And I know it's not exact, but it is reasonably close. If anybody's interested, this is a uh, Rust-Oleum uh, Royal Blue. 7727 7, Royal Blue I got at uh, my local big box Menards and uh, in fact to be honest with you the most trouble I had with the whole project believe it or not was getting the paint to lay down I know that sounds silly but I ended up painting it I think three times the, the shield uh, and even then I'm still not really satisfied uh, with the quality of the paint job I just had a heck of a time getting that paint to lay down and, and I don't know why that was more frustrating than anything else that I did for this project. The power supply or the control box is again very similar to what Pragmatic Lee did. Uh, the layout of the controls might be different, but I think the, the readout is exactly the same as his. Uh, the box, the control box, you can get it a, um, any home uh, supply, Menards, Lowe's, Home Depot, it's sealed power cable in, power cables out. Uh, the motor, I think, is exactly the same as what pragmatically used, and the, the fundamentals of the design inside. Uh, I'll go ahead and run it over so you can see it work. Right now, it's in a disengage mode to the left. Right, we'll go ahead and operate it a bit so you can see how it works. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because others have done, done this in detail. But 
engaged, disengaged, engaged, disengaged. So I'm going to go ahead and run it over to the right. You can see the switch is, this is neutral by the way. Throw this to the right, make sure it's engaged. And off it goes. And back to the left. You can see the readout's at 100%. One other thing that I, I think I did different than pragmatically um, is I mounted the limit switches to prevent over travel in the middle, and they're mounted um, permanently in the middle. They could be moved, I suppose, to the outside. You can see the limit switch here and here. And I think he put his on the outside. The one downside to how I chose to implement it is I lose about two inches of travel on this end and about one inch on that end, on the, on the right end, I should say. <clears throat> now, frankly, in almost one year that I've had this mill, and I've used it quite a bit, actually, um, I have not had... Um, any need to get that far out on uh, the travel to this point in using the lathe or using the mill. Ultimately, if I do find I need more bed travel, I can take this unit off completely, probably in less than five minutes. I can have it removed, put the original end plate back on, and I'll have full range of motion uh, of the mill. I also um, covered the wiring going to the limit switches with, believe it or not, this is motorcycle sleeving that I use on my uh, motorcycle projects. Those of you that might have watched some of my other videos about resleeving uh, handlebar controls and such, this is the same material. This is a six millimeter inside diameter and it works perfect to bundle, it, bundle the wiring and to keep it uh, clean from oil and swerf and those kind of things. So what I'll do now is I'll um, remove the covers both for the limit switches and for the uh, drive unit itself. And we'll take a little bit closer look. Well, there's the inner workings of the drive mechanism. Again, engaged so that the, this is a three quarter inch deep well socket. And you can see the socket as it slides over engages with the hex that's engaged disengaged. So when it's in disengaged mode like this, I can crank it manually or I can certainly engage it and then let the motor drive it as you would expect for a power feed. I'm not going to go through all the details of the design because I'd basically be duplicating uh, everything that Pragmatically talked about. If you go back and watch his videos, um, he gives a very good explanation of how he did what he did and why he did it that way. And again, at risk of being redundant, I essentially copied his implementation, except for the drive nut, which I will talk about uh, in, a, in a separate piece here in a moment. I did this a little bit different, the drive nut, but for all practical purposes, um, this implementation is the same as his. There's the power supply for the uh, mini mill x-axis power feed. And again, this is a essentially a copy of a unit that Pragmatically did a very nice video on. And uh, it's a repurposed computer power supply. It has 12 volt DC, 5 volt DC, and 3.3 volt DC outputs here. The mini mill uh, motor is running with a 12 volt DC. Um, it's mounted in such a way that it fits over the, this back lip on my workbench so it's movable. This is not mounted. This can be slid. It can be picked up and moved to another part of the workbench. Um, it's out of the way and that, that worked out really well. Just a pilot light, tells you when it's on. 
or not. And uh, this power cord here goes directly into the uh, control box for the uh, x-axis power feed. As I've said before, uh, I follow Pragmatic Lee's design quite closely. I did uh, do a few things differently, and one is the what I'll call the drive coupler nut. That's what this is right here. And this engages the end of the shaft on the mini mill the fork shaft, and you see the roll pin in there. That's one of the things I, I did different. And I machined this from one piece of steel. I think he made his from aluminum, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Instead of using a screw through here like Lee did, I just used a, uh, a double roll pin and put a roll pin in a roll pin and uh, drove it through there, as you can see there. And I, So that's just a roll pin rather than a screw. And it's below flush on each side of the of the of the piece. This is the set screw that locks it onto the shaft. Obviously, I have the set screw itself out. And per his advice, I moved it further down this way than what he did, and that seemed to work out just fine. I don't know if the set screw is really required. I did uh, have it running, and I took this apart to do this video. Uh, I could probably leave that set screw out and it wouldn't make any difference. The primary thing I want to share with you is I machined this out of one piece of steel. This is three quarter inch hex stock you can see here that I actually started with this. And this actually is the piece of uh, steel stock, raw stock that I cut this from. <clears throat> the reason I did it that way is because because then I didn't have to worry about the um, coming up with a, a um, I think Lee used a nut or a bolt that he put in the end, I believe it's 9 sixteenths. This is three quarter because he advised going larger, so I had some three quarter inch hex stock. That started as my, my base, and then I machined around it. The only thing on this piece that's not part of the original hex stock is this collar which is aluminum, that's a press fit. I think Lee did something quite similar. Uh, but I machined that and then pressed it on, a uh, light press fit, and that's not going to go anywhere. This slides onto the shaft and right up against the face plate on the mill. And then the socket right here goes like that. See? That's a, again, that's three quarter inch. So this is nothing but a three quarter inch deep socket. It's not a spark plug socket. It's a 12 point deep socket that I also put this ring on to allow for the lateral movement, which you'll see in another part of the video, which I did uh, virtually identically to what Lee did for all practical purposes. The specific of my, specifics of my implementation might vary just a little bit, but it's, it's, it's the same concept. So this comes back like this and can, and can freewheel, and then it slides on to lock, and then it can turn the shaft accordingly. So again, the differences from Lee is this is one piece of steel the coupler nut itself. This obviously I left and just cleaned it up from the original rusty stock. And then I did have to put this, uh, it really becomes almost a bushing that goes up against and it limits the, the travel of the socket. And that way the socket doesn't go right up against the face plate on the end of the mill. I set this off by probably a sixteenth of an inch and just lock that that uh, set screw down. <clears throat> but again, even if I didn't lock it down, I'm not sure it's really going to go anywhere. But that's proved to work quite well for me. One of the other things I did different than uh, pragmatically, this is the end plate that goes against the end of the mill, attaches to the mill itself. And one of the things that I did You'll see where I had a boo-boo right there. I drilled these holes in the wrong spot and had to plug them with drill rod. Uh, anyway, this is aluminum. 
But what I did, what I want to share is I put a oil, oil light bushing in here. You can see it right there. That uh, this sits like this, that intercepts the shaft from the mill. It'll sit about flush with the end like that. The reason I did that is I wanted to just ensure that that, that uh, shaft had something to ride in rather than just the aluminum. Probably overkill, not absolutely necessary, but I got this bushing from uh, McMaster Car and it was just a few bucks. It was very inexpensive. In fact, you can't buy the raw material if you don't have it. And put the time into machining this uh, versus buying it. It's just so much easier just to buy it already made and it's, again it's already pre-lubricated so you can see it there. So that's one other little change that I made. Well there you have it. That's a bit of an overview of what I've been working on recently. It's done now. I'll put the covers back on and move on to my next project which will probably be a motorcycle. Kawasaki 350 triple probably. And uh, I have a bandsaw, a mini bandsaw that I'm going to fabricate. So between those two uh, projects, it's the next thing that I'll be working on. As usual, thanks for watching.